city which needn't be mentioned. On a street with no name, there is a house without a number. in the line of fire in his old green campaign coat. <laughs> One would think the coat was made of steel armor, so unconcerned he is. Have you seen him? Yes, once or twice. Well, how do I look? It's bewitching, just like everything about you. <laughs> do you think I could bewitch you, Napoleon? Why do you always worry about other men, Pauline? I don't. I don't worry Your about flirting them. will get you into trouble one day, if you don't watch out. You and your jealousy, Andre. I was only teasing. <sighs> you little mink. It wasn't Madame Dupre that Pauline was so reluctant to keep waiting. It was, of course, Napoleon. And while poor Captain Fouré remained blissfully unaware of the rendezvous, news of the meetings quickly and regularly reached John Barnett via the most valuable accomplice a spy can have, a servant. Abdul had to work hard for the few coppers Madame Dupré paid him each week. Gathering information for John Barnett was much less onerous, and the pay was much better. It was a most satisfactory arrangement for them both. They're together again. It seems that our two friends are getting very chummy indeed. Then let's get on with them instead of behaving like a couple of peeping toms. We know when Napoleon visits the Dupre house. We can lie and wait to cross the road with rifles. When the old boy comes out, we can bag him. Yes. And if we were caught at it, they'd find out we were English. Then, instead of preventing a war, we'd be starting one. No, this must be done in such a way that England cannot be blamed for his death. Somehow, I think Captain Foy can help us to do the job. The next day, as he was sipping an aperitif in a crowded cafe, Captain Fouré was not unduly concerned when a stranger asked if he could share his table. And the next day, when the stranger invited him to share his table, he accepted without reservations. This time, the stranger introduced himself as Ahmed Fayal, a dealer in rare and exotic objets d'art. Here is a very beautiful thing, Captain, truly. Look at the workmanship. All done by master craftsmen and in pure gold. It is beautiful. Ah, then why not take it for your wife? She will adore it, I assure you. I'm afraid it is a little too expensive, my friend. I'm only a captain, not a general. The prize? Do not let that concern you, my dear captain. For you, it will be so little. For me? Why? Because we are friends and because I can well afford it. Yesterday, I sold its twin for ten times it what it is worth. You would never guess to whom I sold it either. To Napoleon. Napoleon? Well, to his equity, but it was for Napoleon. I am not supposed to know this, but I do. I know for whom he bought it too. His new paramour. I do not believe it. But it is true. I do not know the young lady's name, but that she exists is known all over Cairo. It will be a big scandal when it breaks out. They say she is married. Oh, ridiculous. Napoleon Bonaparte But wouldn't... he sees her three times a week. Oh, not in public where people can see. He meets her at General Dupre's house. <laughs> the fox. It is all arranged, you know. At General Dupre's? You are sure? Oh, absolutely. I uh, heard it from the guard who accompanied him there only last night. Nonsense. I, I don't believe a word of it. It's just gossip. Well, perhaps you are right. All I know is, if I had a pretty young wife who visited General Dupre's house two or three times a week, I... <laughs> but this does not concern us, my dear Captain. Uh, what about the coal? The coal? My... I'll let you know 
Pauline. Pauline, where are you? What is it, darling? Why are you shouting? What are you doing? I'm dressing. Why? Where are you going? I told you this morning. To Madame Dupre for dinner. You're not gone. I won't permit it. <laughs> You've suddenly gone mad, Andre. Of course I'm going. Madame Dupre expects me. Is it Madame Dupre? Or is it somebody else? Andre! Tell me, who is it you meet there? I've told you before. Friends of Madame Dupre get together to chat and gossip. You lie. It is Napoleon. Napoleon? Oh, Andre! You deny he is a constant visitor at the Dupre's. No. No, I understand he's there quite often. You understand? I've only seen him once or twice, and then only in passing. I wish I could see him more often. For your sake, Andre. For my sake? Yes. For then I could tell him what a wonderful man I'm married to. And what a fine soldier. What are you talking about? You, your career. Why do you think I'd go to Madame Dupre? Because I enjoy sitting around listening to a flock of idle hens gossiping over their knitting. I go because of you. Because Madame Dupre is the wife of your commanding general. A word from her and you could... Well, you could be a major. Perhaps even a colonel. Now, if I could get Napoleon's ear... You... you are telling the truth. You know I am, darling. Whatever I do, it's for you. To, to help you. Oh, my darling, my sweet. What a fool I have been. Here I've been thinking. You thought what, Andre? I thought that nothing, nothing. We will forget about it. Let us forget my stupidity. Let us go to the bazaar. There's a beautiful thing there that I want to buy for you. I would love to go, Andre. Believe me, I would. But but I must go. To Madame to pray? Andre. I I swear to you, I will never say another word about it. Good. But I will miss you while you are gone, my sweet. So hurry back. But I tell you, he is suspicious of me. I had all I could do to, to convince him I was meeting the friends of Madame Dupre here tonight. You didn't tell a lie. Am I not a friend of Madame Dupre? Be serious, please. He finds out... Well, I mean, I told you when you were with me, I don't even want to hear his name. He does not exist. For you. But I have to live with him. And I'm frightened, frankly. He, he's a terrible temper. If he found out, if he knew, he would kill me. Stop worrying about him, my dear. If he gets to be a problem, I will handle him. Well, Napoleon, I wouldn't want him hurt. Hurt? One hurts those who are important. All I need do to get him out of the way is have him assigned to night duty. Now enough talk of him. The subject is closed. This, as you see, is a pistol. Don't be alarmed, it isn't loaded. But assume that it were, how dangerous is it? This way, resting on my desk, it is no more dangerous than these books. But now, how about now? No, not even now. For there is one element still lacking, the will to fire. And without that, even a loaded pistol cannot kill, except by accident. John Barnett knew he could not depend upon chance to eliminate Napoleon for him. And since he was unable to do the job himself, he had to find a man who could. But he had to be led, carefully, artfully, step by step, to that final act of violence. It is easy to make a jealous man suspicious of his pretty young wife, especially when she is foolish enough to cooperate. A hint there, 
An innuendo here. A choice bit of spicy gossip. Well, it, it, it is perfectly logical she should go to Madame Dupre's. After all, the general's wife entertains the wives of his officers all the time. Does she? <laughs> Madame Dupre rarely entertains at all. And never the wives of officers. You do not know this? Little drops of poison. Yes, it is easy to make a jealous man suspicious and to fan that suspicion into hate. But to bring him to the point where madness overcomes reason, that takes time. And doing it. Many thank you, sir. You must come to my shop again. I have so many beautiful things. Well, again last night. Shortly after Madame Foray left, the captain followed her to the Dupre house. And? He just stood around watching. When Napoleon arrived, I thought he might make a move, but no. He just watched him go in and turned and left. Give him time, Colin. Give him time. A man does not readily admit, even to himself, that the two people he loves most in this world have both betrayed him. But when that realization does come, he'll kill Colin. He'll kill. And so the pressure was increased, the doubts doubled, the hatred fanned, until one day... You will please stop this filthy gossip monger. I don't like it. I don't want to hear any more of it. I am so sorry, Captain. I did not know it disturbed you. It does. Oh, you know the lady in question. Why do you ask that? From the way you spoke, I imagine that you did. She is the wife of a friend, perhaps. Yes, that's it. The wife of a friend. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Does he know? The husband, I mean? I, I don't know. I don't think so. Of course not. The husband is always the last to know in these things. Yes. It seems so. I wonder what he would do if he found out. Do? What could he do? I know what I would do. Kill the man. Kill Napoleon? Yes, even Napoleon. Look, my friend, when a man uses his position, however exalted, to steal another man's wife, he does not deserve to live. You are right. Not even Napoleon himself has the right. True. But it will take a man to make him pay for it. A real man. Andre. I thought I heard you come in. What are you doing? You can see, no? Why? Because... Because I am going on duty. Oh. oh, a courier from General Dupre came a little while ago. Another invitation to supper for you? No, not for me. The General wants to see you at his home immediately. It's most urgent. See me? Why? I don't know. He only said that it was most urgent. I can see him first, I guess. What do you mean, first? Nothing. Andre, aren't you going to kiss me goodbye? Goodbye, Pauline. You mean I'm to return to France, General? Those are your orders, Captain. They seem clear enough to me. I'm sorry, sir. I didn't mean... It is so unexpected. Yes, I imagine so. These are the dispatches you are to take with you. They are to be guarded with your life. I understand, sir. Oh, sir. Yes, what is it? A request, sir. May I be permitted to take my wife with me? Back to France, I mean. Captain? I was under the impression that you understood the dangers involved in running the British blockade. 
I do, sir. Only I... Then I consider this a most foolish request for you to make. As a soldier, you must take certain risks. But to risk the life of your wife is not only foolhardy, but selfish in the extreme. Yes, sir. But my wife and you I... You will go aboard the Chasseur within the hour. You will report to Captain Durot. General, may I not see my wife before I leave? Captain. The Chasseur sails with the tide. You have just time to get there. Oh, General Oh, Dwight. there you are, you lazy beggar. See that you clean thoroughly today. Captain Foray has sailed for France. What? Where did you hear that? From Abdal. He was eavesdropping at the door when the general gave the captain his orders. Abdal gave me these for you. They're copies of the dispatches that Foray has taken to France with him. Why the sudden urgency to send a courier to France? And why was Foray... Did you read these? Yes, I did, but they seem to be in some sort of a code. No, I don't think they are in code. There's a British frigate lying off Hagar. If we can get to her in time, we might be able to intercept Foray. Come on. <laughs> From Cairo to El Hagar is 15 miles. They made it in a little less than an hour. There, luck was with them still. For the British sloop, Lion, on blockade duty in that sector, was lying offshore and picked them up immediately. The chase was on. For two days it continued. Two days without a sight of anything but the empty sea. Then on the afternoon of the second day, the long hoped for cry of sail ho came from the lookout. It was the chasseur. Colin! We've got him, Colin. We've got him. Lightly armed and slower than the British sloop, the chasseur surrendered without a fight. And within the hour, Captain Fouré and John Barnett met once again. Is it for hell? No, not for hell, Captain. John Barnett of His Majesty's Intelligence Service. Intelligence? Then you are a spy. I'm afraid you have me, sir. You fooled me. You took advantage of my friendship. In a small way, I admit. But what I told you of Madame Fouré and Napoleon was and remains the truth. It is another of your lies. Oh, come, Captain. Surely you don't believe that. Did you not follow her to Madame Dupré? Did you not see Napoleon arrive a few moments later? Not once, but half a dozen times. Will not listen to you. What would you say, Captain, if I told you that Napoleon had his suspicions and sent you to France to get rid of you? I'd say you are still lying. Oh, really? Uh, did you read the orders you were carrying? Do read them now. I'm sure you'll find them interesting. Very well, then listen to them. To the Commissary General, I request the following household supplies for my own personal use. 20 cases of vin ordinaire for table use, red and white. 10 extra sacks of coarse salt and 4 of sugar. Reduce the usual shipment of cured meats by 10 barrels. Shall I go on? Let me see that. It is a code of some kind. No, Captain, it is not in code. It's a quite ordinary shopping list. It could have gone by a regular courier. I do not believe it. Oh, come, Captain. Surely you believe that Napoleon chose this method to get rid of you, so that he would have a free hand with your wife. If I could just get my hands on that dog. Well, I think that can be arranged. On both of them? On her, too, just for an hour or two. What would you do, Captain, if you were given that opportunity? Do? What would any man of honor do? Well, I think I can arrange to take you back to Cairo. Cairo? Yes, Captain. And if you have the courage of your convictions... He's gone. Let us forget him. He never even existed. Andre! Captain Foray. Thought you well on your way to France. I have come back. To kill you. Andre, please. 
You'll regret it. Be quiet. I'm going to kill you both. But first you. You are going to die in your famous green coat. It is fitting that way, the coat that you wore in battle. How many times I saw you when it's facing enemy fire in Italy. I used to think it was a, a charm to turn aside bullets. It will not turn aside this one. You have a gun in your hand, Captain. I presume it is loaded and cocked. You're going to shoot to it. You are not afraid to die, huh? Or do you think your coat will protect you as it always has? I think you're a fool, Captain. I think it is you who are afraid. I will show you! You will give me that gun. Give it to me. You intend to shoot a man, Captain. Shoot him as soon as he is within range. If you wait, betray your own fear. Now get out. <laughs> I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. What do you mean you couldn't do it? He's Napoleon. He is the man who stole your wife. The man who sent you to almost certain capture just to get you out of Cairo. You don't understand. He's Napoleon. A simple mechanical device, a pistol. Load it, cock it, aim it. Press the trigger, and it fires. But it takes more than muscular power to pull a trigger. It takes the will to fire. And Captain Fure lacked the will. Strange as it may seem, he just couldn't shoot Napoleon. It's the one thing John Barnett has not even thought of, the human factor. Without it, a spy's life would certainly be easier, but not nearly so interesting. 